Okay, good morning. And again, thank you to, for the invitation. And I've enjoyed this discussion so far and look forward to a full day of, of exciting discussion. Um, just a, a word for the, the sponsor. I'm at Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy National Laboratory. The Department of Energy is very much concerned with the ability of the nation uh, to meet its energy needs and with uh, constraints that may be placed on that by uh, external considerations such as climate change. So that's, that's our raison d'etre for, uh, for the work we do in trying to understand uh, climate, understand climate change, and see what its implications are. I'm not sure that the Department of Energy uh, listens very much, but they nonetheless support their work. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, empirical, I hope that uh, window goes away, click on and share additional features. I don't want the additional features, but I'm going to try and get rid of that box and see what happens. Uh, thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's observational information that's available to us about um, Earth's climate sensitivity and some of the implications of the uncertainties therein. And um, that really uh, requires some definitions. And, and I was afraid Dan was going to uh, steal what I had to say, or perhaps hoping that he might, and then I didn't have to go through it. But I really have to go through some algebra with you folks. Um, and so bear with me. OK. This is the, the heat budget of the planet. H is the heat content of the planet. And any change in heat content with time uh, will we'll refer to by this letter N, which is a net flux of heat into the planet. And there's only one place that energy can come into or out of the planet from, and that's space. Uh, so we have the sun that's heating the planet, and solar energy is absorbed. And infrared energy goes out the top, and you all know this. So, so that the, this net heat flux is the difference between what's absorbed and emitted. And for an unperturbed climate system that we uh, will denote as a steady state, um, then, then this change in heat content with time is zero. If we apply a forcing, we've changed in some way the, the uh, amount of outgoing radiation by putting some more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that absorbs the radiation and doesn't let it so much get out the top, then we'll call that, that a forcing. Uh, we apply this forcing, so the, the net heat is initially equal to the, the forcing. But then the climate system responds, and the climate system responds to counteract the forcing that's been applied to it. And we make an ansatz that the uh, response is proportional to the change in the global mean surface temperature represented here by T, and that proportionality coefficient, a sensitivity coefficient called lambda. Now we can get into this concept of equilibrium climate sensitivity. I put it in quotes, and I try to put it in quotes. It is not an equilibrium. Earth's climate system is nowhere near an equilibrium. Energy is coming in in the short wave. It's going out in the long wave. Equilibrium means you have detailed balance, and you have exactly the same amount of energy flow on, on uh, equal and opposite on all paths. We do not have an equilibrium. We use the term equilibrium. We misuse the term equilibrium. OK, enough on that. Um, the, uh, under the, so here's the equation that the net heat is equal to the forcing minus the uh, uh, response coefficient times the change in temperature. And do some algebra on that. And it says the change in temperature is equal to forcing minus net heat upon this lambda. When you reach a new steady state, commonly called equilibrium, the change in temperature, uh, uh, the, 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 the n goes to 0. So you get the delta t is f upon lambda. And we call that an equilibrium sensitivity. Uh, times the forcing. And then for in general, so this S is equal to delta T equilibrium upon forcing. It's the inverse of lambda. The units ought to be uh, kelvins, degrees kelvin, degrees centigrade, per watt per meter squared. But they aren't. Uh, so because everybody talks about a CO2 doubling. So rather than uh, what, I, what I will do for the purpose of this presentation, what I do in a lot of what I write, is I say kelvins per 3.7 watts per meter squared to put it in the same number framework that you people are all familiar with. So that assumes that a, a CO2 doubling is 3.7 watts per meter squared. We don't know that number all that well. Even that number we don't know all that well in, in our community. But that's the, so I'll express it as kelvins per 3.7 watts per square meter. OK, so how can we then go about 
observationally, empirically determining climate sensitivity? Well, it's very easy. You measure um, the change in temperature over some period of time. You measure um, the uh, change in the heat content with time. You measure the forcing. Uh, you, you do this simple piece of algebra, and you multiply by 3.7, you're done. So you got it. That's it. OK, so what do we have? We have delta T. We know that from observations. That's 0.78 Kelvin from mid, uh, late 19th century, sort of typical. Um, it's a thermometric record. So thermometry was very good even in the early 1800s, but uh, the distribution globally was not all that good. Uh, so we get, we get from arguably uh, something like eight, 1860 to 1880 and take that as a base, and then we we'll would measure the temperature against that. But we know this number. Two significant figures, not bad. OK. Uh, the heating rate, how do you get that? You go out in the ocean, you measure the temperature in the ocean, you do it enough places, enough time, uh, and, uh, so that you can get an ocean heat content at a given time. Then you do it again later, and you, you draw a slope between those, and you say that's the heating rate of the ocean. And the ocean is almost all the heat capacity of the climate system. Um, on time scales of, of our interest in time scale becomes very important. Um, you think about it, the, the, the mass of the atmosphere is equal to the mass of the first 10 meters of, of uh, ocean water. The heat capacity of the atmosphere is equal to the heat capacity of the first two and a half meters of ocean water. So ocean's got all the heat capacity in it. So we measure the ocean, we make a little bit of correction for the other things, we get N. So N can be measured. Forcing, this change in the radiation balance that we have imposed upon the climate system is not well known. So what I'm going to do in, throughout this talk is consider forcing an unknown quantity or a variable quantity, and I'll look at things as a function of an assumed range of forcing. And then we can talk about, well, what do we know about this forcing in order to do this simple piece of algebra? That's all we need to do. OK, so here is taking into account this 0.78, the 0.35 watts per square meter by which the ocean is heating, or the planet is heating, is inferred from ocean calorimetry. And we say, as a function of this forcing, taking these two numbers into account, then I can say, well, if the forcing is uh, 3 watts per square meter, I've got a, something like an equilibrium sensitivity of, of 1 uh, kel, uh, Kelvin per 3.7 watts per square meter is the units that I'm using. On the other hand, if this forcing is down here at 1, I'm up here at eight, uh, 6, 8, 10. Uh, so it's very sensitive to uh, this forcing that we impose on it. So what do we know about the forcing? Oh, here's the, uh, here's the AR5 estimate of the climate sensitivity range. And we've heard discussions on that earlier and what, do the, what does this mean. This is the so-called likely range. This is the central 68% of the uh, PDF. And then here's the, uh, the 114 and another 14, 16 and 16, sorry, on, on the two ends of that. Uh, and and, and that's, that's what's represented by, by that bar from the IPCC AR5. Here's the climate models that participated in the CMIP-5, at least those were available at the time for this analysis. And you see where they're sitting on here in terms of the forcing and, and, and um, their uh, so-called equilibrium sensitivity. Um, forcing. This is again from the AR-5. And a lot of what I'm going to say now is, is sort of has to be in, in the subjunctive. Because we, you, you, what we're say, seeing here is best estimates by the community. And we talk about the IPCC as they. No, the IPCC is us. I mean, we all contribute to this, whether we're on the committee or not on the committee. In terms of our research, we're all doing, we're all contributing to this sort of thing. So here's the forcing by the long-lived greenhouse gases: carbon dioxide, uh, methane, uh, um, uh, nitrous oxide, CFC 11 and 12 uh, um, in that category. And and you see, even this has has a kind of a spread on it. Here's the comparison with AR4. Here's again a situation where something that we thought was pretty well known up here in the AR4 has gotten larger in terms of our understanding of, of the consequences of that. And, and why is, there, is that happening? Because you put a pulse of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere rapidly adjusts. And so there's really the uncertainty associated with that rapid adjustment that's responsible for this. There's some other reasons behind it. OK, so then. Here's this thing called aerosols. And aerosols, I don't think the word has been mentioned, although it appeared on Dan's, uh, a couple of Dan's slides. What is an aerosol? An aerosol is a suspension of small particles in air. It's a stable suspension. Um, uh, it's haze. It's smoke. Uh, it's clouds. Those are all aerosols. But in, this, in our business, um, an aerosol is, is, is doesn't include clouds. Oh, oh, aerosols can modify the properties of clouds. So 
It's this urban smog writ large. Um, these particles uh, have a residence time in the atmosphere about a week. Uh, they get transported order of thousands of kilometers. They reflect or scatter sunlight. You're looking at a distant object. If it's a clear day, you can see it. If it's a hazy day, you can't see it, mainly because of sunlight hitting particle and particle scattering light into your eye. Well, some of that sunlight gets scattered up out of the atmosphere and, and has a cooling effect on the planet as a consequence of that. And you can see that the PDF, which is what's plotted here, I'm glad the economists like PDFs, I do too, the, uh, the PDF that's, that's, that's on it is, is pretty broad, so when you convolve these two in to get the total anthropogenic forcing and climate, so you got a large range, which has got uh, going down here towards zero net forcing, and up here towards something like four watts per meter squared net forcing. Well, look, the temperature change that we've experienced, if the net forcing on this thing is zero, then it means is that, that you've got a huge sensitivity. And, and alternatively, if the forcing is up here, it means the sensitivity is a lot lower. So that's why it's so strongly dependent upon this, this, this forcing. OK. So now I'm putting that PDF on the chart that I showed you previously. And you can see that this PDF is, is show, shown here. And then I put the, the uh, uh, again, in the IPCC codes, the, 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 it's very likely, it's likely within this range and it's very likely within this range. Um, uh, so it's 90% of that PDF is within this lighter shaded and 68% and, and, and of the PDF is in the darker shading. And you can put that on, on the same sensitivity chart. So here's the sensitivity plotted as a function of that forcing. And you can see where these two things lie. And what I, the, the point that I would make is, a point that I would make is that this likely range of forcing that we get with the likely un understanding of what the, what the uh, uh, of sensitivity that with the likely range of the forcing is well lower than the likely range that's associated with the, 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 that the IPCC came up with in their assessment, um, and, and and for the, for that matter, well lower than than all these CMIP five climate models. Uh, Here's a PDF of equilibrium climate sensitivity taking, where did it come from? It came from the PDF of forcing. So I, I just uh, uh, transformed that PDF of forcing into a PDF of climate sensitivity for you, for you folks. So uh, here's the equilibrium sensitivity, here's the PDF against the equilibrium sensitivity. And you see that this is likely within this range, it, it only goes up a little bit more than two. And it goes well below, uh, uh, it goes almost down to this one, um, and, and well below the center of gravity of, of the numbers on the IPCC and well below the center of gravity of the model. So this is observation. Do I know that this is right? No, I have no idea what's right because I don't know what the forcing is. I'm, I'm giving you a very broad PDF on the forcing, and I'm, I'm taking IPCC's word for what they think that they, we think that forcing is. But is, is forcing really in that number? No, because we, we, it's, it's a tough number to get a hold of for, for a lot of, of, of reasons. But if I take that PDF of forcing, then this is what I get. You can't deny it. You can't dispute it. Um, do we want it? And this is a very important paper. There's a commentary uh, published by Miles Allen, David Frame, is in Science back in 07. Um, and they're saying an upper bound on climate sensitivity has become the holy grail of climate research. It, it's inherently hard to find. It promises lasting fame and happiness to the finder, but it may not exist and turns out not to be very useful. So they suggest it's time to call off the quest. Um, why? Because we don't live in an equilibrium world. It takes time to get there. And so that's, that's the, the thrust of what they're trying to say in, in, in this commentary. Um, here's a depiction of that. And I think we've seen similar sorts of pictures uh, earlier in the presentation. This is uh, the, the lower chart here. It's on two different time scales. Here's 0 out to 50 years, and here's 0 out to 1,000 years. And here's a step function change in forcing. So at time zero, uh, you, 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 you impose a forcing on the system. And then up here is climate system response. And I've done this with a two-compartment model. But the two-compartment model really captures what, what you got in the, in the GCM. So two compartments is great. And so you, you, you tune the time constants, actually based on observations. Uh, and it, it really matches up with, with, with at least some of the GCMs. The, um, so what you're seeing is here on this, on this time scale of 50 years, this temperature is shown here in the blue, which is the upper compartment. The lower compartment is the deep ocean. The upper compartment is where we live, the uh, part of the, of the world that doesn't have a lot of heat capacity and therefore doesn't have a lot of time constant. That kind of looks like it's leveling off. But if you were to follow that number 
over this period on to 1,000 years, you're, you'll slowly be approaching the so-called equilibrium uh, sensitivity result that you would get. The lower compartment of the ocean is a heat sink. O over this whole period of time, if the, the lower part of the ocean is colder than the upper part, it's drawing heat from the upper part and it therefore is, is not letting the upper part get as warm as it would otherwise get. And that's, so that's the physics of the situation. That's a step function fu uh, forcing, which is not so realistic. A ramp function is, is more realistic. So here's your ramp function down here again as a function of time. And here's the change in temperature over this period of time. And it looks like it's kind of going up uh, at, a, at, a, at a slope that's, that's, that you'd sort of expect. And in fact, if you put the temperature upon the forcing, you say, is, is, is this a constant? It's kind of leveling out, uh, leveling out near what we would call the transient sensitivity of the planet, and a bit, sort of well below this equilibrium sensitivity that you would get if you ran the thing out. And Dan mentioned you've got to run these things for, for thousands of years, largely, uh, and, and, certainly, and certainly in this model, uh, because of, of the time that it takes to distribute that heat in, into the ocean. Oceans mix very slowly. So, so this transient sensitivity, in some sense, that's where we live. So transient sensitivity, I think, advocate is much more important quantity, and that's sort of the point that, that Frame and Allen had in, in that piece. So what's the transient sensitivity? Well, here's what we saw before. The transient sensitivity is even easier. You don't, you don't subtract the N from the forcing, and you got the same equation, and, and you're back in business. Uh, so we now we do this exactly the same thing, and we've got a PDF on the transient sensitivity, and that transient sensitivity is, is, a, is showing you up again here, same units, Kelvins per 3.7 watts per square meter. Here's one on this thing, so you got the, this likely within this range is actually going below the, the, the one on that and up to something like the two for that transient sensitivity, which is, is in some sense what we and our children and our grandchildren care about um, and, and, and pay attention to it. And again, comparing with the models on their transient sensitivity with AR5 translating the equilibrium sensitivity into the transient sensitivity it is well lower than those numbers that are showing up in the assessment. Why do I think that's the case? I think that what the case is that the aerosol community does its own research and publishes it in the aerosol chapter of the IPCC. The modelers started seven years ago at the, at the end of, the, of AR4 to run their models for the AR5. So they lag about one cycle in, in, the, in the current understanding of the aerosol forcing. And aerosol forcing is tough to get a, a, a handle on. Okay, so um, a Gedanken experiment, a very nice experiment, says, okay, what happens if you turn off emissions? And so these are two different papers. I was hoping uh, uh, Rito Canuti might have been here. He was on the list at some point. And, and he's, done, he's thought a lot about this sort of thing. So here's, here's from a paper of his. And he says, OK, uh, at, at year uh, 2010, I believe it was, you turn, you turn the CO2 emissions, emissions to zero and, uh, and hold all of the forcings constant. Um, and an earlier paper uh, out of the Hamburg group uh, uh, it's basically the same kind of thing, and it has slightly different results. Why? Models have different kinds of sensitivities, different time constants. Uh, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a, a, a full GCM. This is, is a simplified representation of, of physics that goes on in GCMs. It doesn't have all those wiggles in it. Okay, so the, the key here is that that's holding everything else in the atmosphere constant. What else is it holding constant? It's holding those aerosols constant. You can't hold those aerosols constant. Where do those aerosols come from? Those aerosols are from smog reactions that come from fossil fuel combustion. If you turn off the, fossil, the, the emissions of the CO2 by hypothetically turning off CO2 emissions because you're turning off combustion, then you're going to turn off the emissions of those aerosols. Those aerosols are really offsetting a lot of the, the warming that we would otherwise be expecting. So you, uh, turn off the aerosols at the same time, and, and you get a bump you get a, a fairly substantial bump. It depends on your model. But what's happened, those aerosols have a residence time in the atmosphere a week. So a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, they're gone. Uh, they're not doing their thing. The offset of the global warming from the CO2 and the other greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere now, whatever offset there is, we don't know how much there is, whatever offset there is, and we think it's substantial, is from the aerosols and the precursor gases that were emitted last week. So we have to continually renew those aerosols. And if we don't continually renew those aerosols, as in this calculation, you get this bump where you're getting up to the 
transient sensitivity response of these two different models over a period of time period, a uh, hundred years of time period, that's what you're getting over that period of time if you turn off those aerosols. So this leads me to this concept of committed warming, and I don't think we've heard the term today. But I'll, I'll introduce it and define it. We can discuss whether the definition is useful. But it assumes that forcing by short-lived species, and importantly, the aerosols go to zero. Uh, we calculate the committed warming. The change in temperature, again, it's a simple formula. The forcing of the greenhouse gases upon the total forcing is still dependent on that total forcing, which I don't know, and the delta T, which I do know. So I get a PDF. It looks identical to the PDF that I just showed you because it is identical. I just changed the scales a little bit. But it basically says, hey, we got a committed warming above pre-industrial in this, in this likely range up to one and a half and maybe somewhat below one. We don't know. In the very likely range, it goes perhaps up to two. We may be committed to, to, to the two uh, with 5% with uh, of the PDF uh, off there to the right. So that's where we are. We're committed to that. It, it's there. We're just offsetting it with the aerosols. OK. Uh, I didn't put up a conclusion slide, but I have a, what I'm calling a for discussion slide. Is the global mean, as Kevin's point, is the global mean surface temperature an appropriate measure of climate change? Is it sufficient? Uh, do other indices of climate change scale with global mean surface temperature? Um, I think they do. The models tend to say that they do, but uh, for discussion. Um, how much increase, this is, this, is, this is subjective, how much increase of global mean surface temperature above pre-industrial is acceptable? Is the equilibrium sensitivity, so-called, important? Is the transient sensitivity more relevant? What is the magnitude of forcing? That is the big question. That's what we've been doing our research on uh, over the past several decades. Okay. Um, how much of a bump in temperature can we expect if we stop emitting the aerosols and the precursors today? The hypothetical. We're not going to do it, but hypothetical. Can we afford to reduce carbon emissions? That's economics, and what is it going to do to our economy and so forth? Or can we afford not to? Okay. And are, are the current climate models reliable enough for planning the missions, and, and, and if not, what can rely on? OK, just a little bit about the climate models. Here's the temperature change that we've experienced. Here's 1850, here it is 2000. Here's the temperature change that, that the planet has experienced from the, from the head crew. Here's the last glacial maximum. And Mark's point on this is, is uh, that's not so far away uh, 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 relative to current temperature of about 14. OK, here's the CMIP-5 climate ensemble. And you can see the spread on those is, is large compared to this. Here's this, uh, uh, sorry, that was the CMIP-3. Here's the CMIP-5. Again, so the question I would ask is, is to what extent those are reliable. OK, time's up. Thank you. <laughs>